Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Riley. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and I have the privilege of welcoming you to today's event, The Case for Black Patriotism, uh, which I'm told is uh, the inaugural event for this uh, new space at the Manhattan Institute. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, so much of the discussion about racial inequality today focus almost, focuses almost exclusively on what whites have done to blacks. Uh, racial discrimination, past and present, is presented as a blanket explanation for disparate outcomes in education, employment, income, crime rates, and so forth. Today's speakers, however, understand that the situation is more complicated than that. They understand that Black people have agency, the ability to make decisions for themselves, and that there are limits to what even the most well-intentioned individuals and government programs can do to address social inequality. Self-help, personal responsibility, human capital development, taking advantage of existing opportunities, these things also must be part of any discussion about inequality in America today. The per first person we will hear from is Glenn Lowry, a professor of economics at Brown University. He's also taught at Harvard and Northwestern, Michigan, Boston University. He's the author of numerous papers and several books about race, as well as a forthcoming memoir that many of us are eagerly anticipating, Glenn. But in my view, Professor Lowry has really distinguished himself simply by being an honest intellectual, a straight shooter, someone willing to follow the facts where they lead and report the results, even if those results don't fit a politically correct narrative. Now that, of course, shouldn't distinguish someone as an intellectual or a scholar, but sadly, today it does. Many of his colleagues in the academy are far more concerned with the appeasing social media mobs than with reporting the truth. Professor Lowry puts truth above popularity. I think we need a hundred more just like him. Responding to the professor will be John Wood Jr. of Braver Angels, which is a grassroots organization dedicated to reducing political polarization in the US. It was started in the aftermath of the election of Donald Trump. And the organization's mission is to find common ground among people who disagree politically. And Mr. Wood has stressed that we ought to be focused on what unites us as Americans, not on what divides us. And I think that's a point worth reiterating here at the outset. It's commonly said that diversity is our strength. And, and by that, people usually mean racial and ethnic and religious diversity. But America's true strength has been our ability to overcome in fits and starts problems associated with diversity and focus instead on what we all have in common. That's been our strength. And I just wanted to share with you a tweet I received to that effect from someone, both the speakers and I both uh, all admire a great deal, a man named Bob Woodson, uh, a community activist based in Washington who sent out a tweet this morning in honor of Veterans Day that said, a very special thank you to all who have served and continue to serve this country. On Veterans Day 2021, we honor those who fight for the precious freedoms we enjoy now. May we never take for granted the opportunities offered to all Americans of every race, creed, and background. So again, someone who sees our real strength as a nation on focusing on what we have in common. So after Mr. Wood speaks, um, I'm sorry, first we're going to hear from, uh, uh, from Professor Lowry, then we'll hear uh, from Mr. Wood, and then we will open it up to questions. So uh, let's get started. Thank you. Watch out for that first step. It's a doozy. Thanks, Jason. 
thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, honored uh, to have this opportunity to address this important question. I'm a black American intellectual in an age of persisting racial inequality in my country. I'm an Ivy League college professor and a descendant of slaves. I'm a beneficiary of the civil rights revolution, which made possible for me a life that my forebears could only have dreamed of. I'm a patriot who loves the country. I'm a man of the West. I'm an inheritor of its great traditions. I've said this many times. Tolstoy is mine. Dickens is mine. Newton and Maxwell and Einstein are mine. Franklin. I was just with Newton, Einstein, Maxwell, Franklin, Hamilton, and Adams are mine. That's my heritage. So what are my responsibilities? I feel compelled to represent the interests of my people, but that reference is not unambiguous. I'm an intellectual at a moment of racial reckoning. And I declare right here and right now for all the world to hear that no matter what the political turmoil that envelops us may be, my fundamental responsibility is to stay in touch with reality and to insist that others do as well. That's what I'm about here today. So brace yourselves. I'm gonna make a case for unabashed black patriotism for the forthright embrace of American nationalism by black people. The currently fashionable standoffishness characteristic of much elite thinking concerning Blacks' relationship to the American project, exemplified, for instance, by the New York Times 1619 project, serves the interest rightly understood of neither the country nor of Black Americans ourselves. Frankly, the America ain't so great and never was posture, popular on campuses and in liberal newsrooms, is a sophomoric indulgence for we Blacks in the 21st century. Our birthright citizenship in this great republic is an inheritance of immense value. To whom much is given of him, much shall be required. We Black Americans are a privileged and a blessed people. Our Americanness is much more important than is our Blackness. We must embrace this great inheritance and resist the temptation to see ourselves as a people apart we Americans of all stripes have a great deal in common and those commonalities can and should be used to show how bridges undergirded by patriotism can be built between black America and the nation as a whole. At bottom, we Americans all want the same things. We all want a legitimate shot at achieving the American dream. We all want each generation to do better than the one that came before. We all want to feel secure in our homes and when we are in public. We all want to live in clean and orderly communities with good services. We want the government to work for us and not the other way around. We want to be treated fairly by the broader society and by our institutions. Our commonalities are endless and connections between various groups in America could be stronger were we to focus more on the things that we have in common instead of those that divide us. Those who make their living by focusing on our differences seem to think that there's something fundamentally wrong with America. Well, they are wrong. It is too easy to overstate the racial problems facing our country or to understate what we have achieved. The right idea for our country is to embrace the ethic of transracial humanism, which Martin King Jr. propounded. We as citizens of this great republic must strive to transcend racial particularism and to stress the universality of our humanity and the commonality of our interests as Americans. I realize that this flies in the face of the dominant anti-racism racism sentiment in our time, but I must insist that the only way to effectively address a legacy 
of historical racism. Without running the risk of inducing a reactionary racial chauvinism on either side of the color line or both sides of the color line is to march on, if only fitfully and by degrees, toward the goal of creating a world where racial identities fade in significance, a world where no person's worth is seen to be contingent upon racial inheritance, a world where we learn how to unlearn race, as the writer Thomas Chatterton Williams has put it. Promoting anti-whiteness, and let's be clear, Black Lives Matter can be found doing just that, will cause those advocates to reap what they sow in a backlash of pro-whiteness. The folks who think that they can insist on spelling black with a capital B while keeping the word white in the lower case are in for a very rude awakening. Better by far for black people and for this country would be to emphasize our common American interest and to de-emphasize our superficial racial differences. Now, racial inequality is real, of course, but inequality in America is not solely or even mainly a racial issue. There are plenty of poor and marginalized white people in this country and they deserve our concern too. Contemporary American politics obsesses to an unhealthy extent about racial identity. Just how important is race? Is it an undeniable difference between people like gender or is it a social construct? Consider for instance, the growing number of interracial marriages and the ever increasing number of people who view themselves as multiracial, including the first black president and the first black vice president of this country. We talk incessantly about racial identity, but what about culture? What about values? Don't these things transcend race? How are we to explain the alienation that afflicts many prosperous black Americans? These folks are being told by demagogues and pundits that white supremacy threatens them, that we've gone back to the 1960s or earlier. They are being led badly astray, I claim here. Black votes are being sought via gross exaggerations of legitimate concerns. We've now reached a place where millionaires like LeBron James can really think they're being hunted down like rabid dogs by rogue cops. Demonstrable facts seem insufficient to stop such false narratives. And yet, just look at what has happened here in the United States of America in the last 75 years. A huge black middle class has developed. There are black billionaires. The influence of black people on American culture is stunning and it has global resonance. Black Americans are rich and powerful, relatively speaking. To put it in perspective, there are 200 million Nigerians and the gross national product of Nigeria is about $1 trillion a year. Americans GDP exceeds 20 trillion a year and we 40 million or so African Americans have claimed to roughly 10% of it. We have access to 10 times the income of a typical Nigerian. What is more, the very fact that the cultural barons and elites of America, the people who run the New York Times and the Washington Post, those who give out Pulitzer Prizes and National Book Awards, those who make grants at the MacArthur Foundation, those who run the human resource departments of corporate America, those who run the universities, those who make the movies, have bought into the woke racial sensibility hook, line, and sinker gives to the lie to such pessimism as the claim that the American dream does not apply to Blacks. It most certainly and emphatically does, and it is coming to fruition daily. To dismiss this reality is to tell our children a lie about their country, a crippling lie which when taken as gospel robs us black people of agency and a sense of control over our lives. A patronizing lie, which betrays profound lack of faith in the capacities of us black Americans to rise to the challenges 
to face up to the responsibilities and to bear the burdens of our freedom. Bearing the burdens of black freedom in America means acknowledging the socially mediated behavioral issues that lie at the root of today's racial inequality problem. These behavioral issues are real and they must be faced squarely to grasp why racial disparities persist. These, I hasten to add, are American problems, not merely matters of communal concern to black people. Nevertheless, downpaying, downplaying behavioral disparities by race is a bluff. Anti-racism activists on the left of American politics claim that white supremacy, implicit bias, and old-fashioned anti-black racism are sufficient to account for black disadvantage. Those who make such arguments are in effect daring you to disagree with them. You must be a racist, they say, one who thinks something is intrinsically wrong with black people if you don't attribute pathological behavior among some of us to systemic injustice. You must think blacks are inferior for how else could one explain the disparities? In calling their bluff, one risks being convicted of the offense of blaming the victim. But this is a debater's trick, it's a dare. At the end of the day, what are those folks saying who declare that something called mass incarceration is racism? That the high number of blacks in jails is a self-evident sign of racial antipathy. To respond commonsensically, no, it's mainly a sign of antisocial behavior by criminals who happen to be black. One risk being dismissed as a moral reprobate. This is so even if the speaker is black, just ask Justice Clarence Thomas. Nobody wants to be canceled, but we should all wanna stay in touch with reality. Common sense and more importantly, the evidence suggests that those in prison are mainly people who have hurt somebody who have stolen something or have otherwise violated the basic norms of behavior which makes civil society possible. Let's be clear, those who are taking lives on the streets of St. Louis, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Chicago are to a man behaving despicably. Moreover, those bearing the cost of such pathology are almost exclusively other Blacks. An ideology that ascribes this behavior to racism is simply not credible. We have so many, get, why have so many been getting away with espousing it for so long? Neither could any sensible person actually believe that 70% of African-American babies born to a woman without a husband is A, a good thing, or B, is due to anti-Black racism. People say this, but they don't believe it. They're bluffing. They're daring you to observe this truth, that the 21st century failures of some African-Americans to take full advantage of the opportunities created by the 20th century's revolution of civil rights are palpable and damning. These failures are being denied at every turn, but this position is simply not tenable. The end of Jim Crow, the advent of the era of equal rights, these were transformative events in the history of our republic. And now, a half century down the line, we still have significant disparities, a shameful blight on our society to be sure, but the plain fact of the matter is that some considerable responsibility for this sorry state of affairs lies with black people ourselves. Dare we Americans acknowledge this? Dare we black Americans accept responsibility for it? Here's another unspeakable truth. We need to put police killings of black Americans into perspective. There are about 1,200 fatal shootings of people by the police in the United States each year, and about one-fourth of those killed in this way are black Americans. 
We are 13 percent of the population, so that's an overrepresentation, though twice as many whites as blacks are shot dead by police in this country every year. You wouldn't know that from the activist rhetoric. Now, 1,200, maybe too many, I'm prepared to entertain that idea. I'd be happy to discuss the training and recruitment of police, their rules of engagement with citizens and the accountability that they should face in the event they overstep their authority. These are legitimate questions. And there is a racial disparity, although there is also a huge disparity in Blacks' rate of participation in violent criminal activity. I am making here no claim, one way or the other, about the existence of discrimination against Blacks in the use of police force. But in terms of police killings, we're talking about 300 Black victims per year, roughly. Few of these are unarmed innocents. Most are engaged in violent conflict with police officers. Some are instances like George Floyd, unquestionably problematic and deserving of scrutiny. But still, we need to bear in mind in this country of 300 million people that there are scores of concentrated urban areas where police regularly interact with citizens and there are tens upon tens of thousands of arrests which occur daily. These events, extremely regrettable and sometimes not reflecting well on the police are nevertheless rare. To put it in perspective, with roughly 20,000 homicides in the United States each year, nearly half of which involved black perpetrators, and the vast majority of those had blacks as victims. For every black killed by a police officer, more than 25 other black people meet their end because of homicides committed by other blacks. Now, this is not to downplay the importance of holding police accountable for how they exercise their power. It's merely to notice how very easy it is to overstate the significance and the extent of this phenomenon precisely as the Black Lives Matter activists have done. This is not good for our country. There is a fundamental point here. There is a terrible threat to social cohesion here in the United States of America implicit in seeing police killings primarily through a racial lens. Such events are regrettable regardless of the race of the people involved. Invoking race gratuitously, emphasizing that an officer happens to be white and a victim happens to be black, is to tacitly presume that the reason said officer acted as he did was because the dead or injured victim was black. Yet this is a presumption seldom tested against the facts. We don't necessarily know this. Moreover, once we go down this road and get into the habit of racializing such events, we may not be able to contain that racialization merely to instances where white cops kill black kids. Soon enough, we may find ourselves in a world where instances of black thugs killing white citizens come to be seen through a racial lens as well. This is a world no thoughtful person should welcome since there are a great many such instances. Framing them as racial events gratuitously is counterproductive in ways that are too obvious for me to detail. When criminals harm people, they should be dealt with accordingly. They do not represent others of their race when they act badly. White victims of crimes committed by Blacks must not come to see themselves mainly in racial terms. When someone steals their automobile, beats them, takes their wallet, breaks into their home, or abuses them. People are playing with fire by gratuitously bringing a racial sensibility to police citizens' interactions. They are playing a race card from the bottom of the deck. Well, they may find soon enough that theirs is not the last play in that game. The narrative that we Black Americans settle upon is crucial to the future of this country. Is this a good country, one affording boundless opportunities to all who are fortunate enough to enjoy the privileges and to bear the responsibilities of citizenship? That's one narrative. 
Or is this a venal, immoral, and rapacious bandit society of plundering racists founded in genocide and slavery and propelled by capitalist greed and unrepentant anti-Black antipathy? That's another narrative. The weight of the evidence overwhelmingly favors the former. For the founding of the United States of America in 1776 and 1787, was a world historic event by means of which enlightenment ideals about the rights of individual persons and the legitimacy of state power came to be instantiated for the first time in world history in real institutions. The founding, of course, entailed a compromise with the institution of slavery, that's true. And yet now, some 40 million strong, we Black Americans have become by far the richest and most powerful large population of African descent on this planet. The issue then is a question of narrative. Are we Blacks going to look through the dark lens of America as a racist, genocidal, white supremacist, illegitimate force in history? Or shall we see our great nation for what it has become over the course of the last three centuries, which is to say, the greatest force for human liber liberty in the world. The narrative we Black Americans choose will influence our assessment of certain key periods in history. There is, of course, the Civil War, which left 600,000 dead in a country of 30 million. The consequences of that war, together with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment enacted just afterwards, did something remarkable and unprecedented in world history. It made the enslaved Africans and their descendants into citizens. And in the fullness of time, we have become equal citizens. Should that last have taken another 100 years? No. Should my ancestors have been enslaved in the first place? No. But we must not forget that slavery had been commonplace in human experience, going back to antiquity, emancipation, the freeing of slaves en masse after a movement for abolition, that was new. That's a Western phenomenon. It's the fruit of enlightenment. And it happened right here in these United States of America with the liberation of 4 million people. Such an achievement surely would not have been possible without the philosophical insights and the moral commitment and the institutional designing genius of the founders of this country. Ideas that were cultivated in the 17th and 18th century in the West. Ideas about the essential dignity of human persons and about what can legitimate a government's exercise of power over its people. Something new was created in America at the end of the 18th century. Slavery was a Holocaust out of which emerged something that advanced the morality and the dignity of humankind, namely emancipation. The abolition of slavery and the incorporation of African descended people into the body politic of the United States of America, these were monumental, unprecedented achievements for human liberty. In closing, I wish to call our attention to that escaped slave and great abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, who in 1852, in a famous speech entitled, Who's Fourth of July, asked America whether he had a share in the nation's civic inheritance. Douglas was cautiously hopeful about the prospect that America might be faithful to the founding principles and grant liberty and equality to his people. But he had to plead with his audience to consider the gravity of the circumstance. He had to indict his country for not standing up to its own ideals. That was in the 1850s. The question Douglas posed, which was open at the time, has been answered by history. As a black American intellectual who loves this country, I can say without equivocation in the year 2021 that the 4th of July, like George Washington, 
like Thomas Jefferson and like Abraham Lincoln, is ours. These things belong to me, a descendant of slaves, every bit as much as they belong to any other American. The question confronting us Black Americans today, the fundamental existential question, is not whether we are included within the body politic as full heirs to the bequest of American political culture, most emphatically we are. Today's question for us American descendants of slaves is not how to end our oppression. Rather, it is what shall we do with our freedom? What shall we make of the enormous inheritance that is our birthright citizenship in history's greatest republic? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I am um, pleased and, and honored um, to, to be here with you today. I do have to point out, of course, that I have the, uh, I, I have the, the more difficult task here today. Uh, Glenn Lowry gets to go first, and I get to go after Glenn Lowry. So, that's, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I beseech you for your for your uh, <laughs> for your for your mercy here for me and my role. And um, as I take it, you know, part of my role here today is to play something of something of devil's advocate here in responding to Glenn's remarks. It, it won't surprise anybody to know that I feel a great deal of resonance with the, with the major themes that Professor Lowry has articulated. Nevertheless, I am here in part to communicate what I feel to be a reality that is necessary for everybody in this room to understand both as an academic and an intellectual matter, but even more importantly, as a, as a function of the fact that it is necessary for us in this day and time, if we are to progress in the context of a racial conversation in America, to reckon with the fact that for all of the excesses of the modern social justice movement, the anti-racist mainstream, the sort of you know, the illiberal, let's say, extremities of the, the gatekeepers for much of our racial conversation, that there is a human experience and an American experience, baked particularly within the context of African-American life and history, which legitimates so much of the outrage we feel and are on the sort of receiving end of oftentimes um, as folks who are perhaps critical of the social justice movement, the modern mainstream, I should say, of the social justice movement, that without being able to reckon with the source of this, this anger and the legitimacy of the experience produces this, that produces it, leaves us ill-equipped to engage in the racial conversation constructively and in a way that could guide us towards unity on the things we might ultimately agree upon. Uh, in the way that we must do if America is to move forward. And so where do I begin in seeking to lay out that perspective? Professor Lowry is entirely right that the United States of America, the story of the United States of America is one of progress, the progress of an imperfect people living up to more perfect ideals, failingly, haltingly, the Black experience itself bears witness to this truth. The fact that Frederick Douglass, even in his own time, the most important Black man, in, in the most famous African-American in the world, but the fact that he was able to rise from slavery and give voice to a vision of Black liberation that ultimately, a mere century and a half later, would result in the election of America's first Black president shows us that there is an arc 
to progress in the United States of America that we must all be grateful for and that the inheritance of the American project uh, accrues to, to black and brown every bit as much as it is the property of those who are those who are white and of European descent in this country. But if you were tracing the outlines of that history, and if you were to ask yourself, where does the anger, where does the frustration, where does the outrage that we feel coming from so many people in this country and so many African-Americans and others in this country, where does it come from in a day where we have an African-American president, where you have black millionaires and black billionaires, where you have an expanded black middle class, where people of color are invited and welcomed into university settings, celebrated in our popular culture around the world, where black people and white people go to school together, live in neighborhoods together. Where does this anger and outrage come from? It may be useful for us to look at it in a couple of different dimensions and remember the fact that the human creature is not a being that in and of himself merely reacts to the distribution of statistical figures on a page indicating the fact that progress has been made in material fashion, but that we are each of us products of the stories that we have received and the experiences that we've actually lived through in the context of our individual and our familial and our communal relationships and day-to-day -day life. What do I mean by that? Let's take a long view. Historically speaking, the 1619 Project, of course, resonated with many people because it planted the beginning of the American experiment with the beginning of slavery. Hundreds of years, a couple centuries worth of bondage, followed by a liberation that opened the African-American experience into a phase in which, after a brief decade of reconstruction where there was some political empowerment of the Black community, African Americans were subjected to the ravages of Ku Klux Klan terrorism, the ostracization of the labor movement. Um, over the course of decades of living in a status quo of oppression in the rural South and finding no warm welcome in the urban centers of the North and ultimately the West, we move forward into the mid 20th century, you have the genuine triumphs of the civil rights movement, the inspiring leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But in that period of time, a decapitation of African-American leadership in the form of the assassinations of key figures was tremendously demoralizing to a black community in which the material gains of the civil rights movement, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, did not necessarily accrue in any tangible or direct way to the majority of African Americans who lived outside of the American South and who were generally concentrated in urban centers where the question of being able to integrate a lunch counter was not as significant as the day-to-day -day poverty and the day-to-day -day oppression that took place in non-Jim Crow parts of America. And this is something that Martin Luther King Jr. reflected himself upon in the moment in which the black power conscience sort of arose in America, uh, because part of the frustration of the militant left at that time had to do with the fact that the civil rights movement, as far as it could see, was not bearing fruits for the majority of African Americans, but moved past the death of Martin Luther King Jr. And you have a period of time where moving into the 1970s, with the advent of the great society, the welfare state, as you might refer to it, you had a circumstance in which a subsistence sort of income was provided to poor people across the country and certainly the African-American community. But this happened at a moment in time where African-Americans were displaced from their, from their economic station in the agricultural and the service sectors of American society. I come from Los Angeles. I live in South Central LA. This was a period of time in which the, importion, the, the importation of foreign labor displaced these, these workers at the same time that the outsourcing of manufacturing opportunities to Asia and elsewhere displaced African-Americans from the manufacturing sector. Genuine pathways towards social mobility and economic progress began to dissolve at a moment in time wherein also the advent of heroin and then crack cocaine came in and began to decimate black communities, both from usage and from the, and from the the violence that followed in the effort to monetize these substances as they came into communities that were already fractured and broken. Part of that fracturing and breaking coming as a result of the fact that the very positive condition of integration 
served as a pool by which the intelligentsia, the leadership of many Black communities sought to integrate suburban and mixed communities, sought to move into institutional America, into university campuses, but out of poor Black inner city communities, out of poor rural communities, ultimately leaving the Black community separated along tracks whereby some African Americans found themselves integrated and celebrated in a multicultural American society that was falling in love with Muhammad Ali and Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, but in which many African Americans remained in a state of poverty, a state of deprivation, wherein now the phenomenon of what we call mass incarceration begins to pick up momentum. The defining dynamics of the relationships between African American communities and law enforcement begins to crystallize. In a context in which it's worth pointing out, law enforcement departments in those eras were frequently themselves corrupted by the money that was passing through the black market, drug market, in places from Harlem to New York City to Los Angeles and Chicago. It's important to remember that this history is not very far behind us. Now, none of this negates the reality of the fact that ultimately it is our capacity to build up our own ability to govern ourselves, to succeed in the marketplace of ideas, the economy through the cultivation of skills, through the building of social capital. None of this is to negate the effectiveness and the necessity of conservative solutions uh, to our most pressing problems, even as we engage the policy arguments in American life, so as to be able to analyze and draw towards consensus on the sorts of sensible reforms towards things like welfare, law enforcement, immigration, that might yield a circumstance in which prosperity and social mobility is more readily available for all. But again, if we think about this in the context of the Black experience, and you imagine a person, an African-American individual, let's say my age, you know, I was born in 1986, just turned 35, in fact. You realize that there are individuals, not just individuals, hundreds of thousands, millions of African Americans who have lived a life in which they are experiencing the social manifestation of certain statistical realities that just seem like numbers on a page until you reckon with them in human terms. I don't know the, pre the precise figures for this, but if you take a brief look at the population and the, and the homicide rate from 1980 to about 1985 or so, you come away with a figure of, of about 100 or 1,000 or so uh, young Black men murdered or killing each other in the context of gang and drug-related violence. Each of those deaths is a tragedy, but you have to multiply the implications of them because that's 100,000 families. That's 100 thousand individuals connected to communities who saw and experienced this tragedy of American life. Add on top of that, of that the tens of thousands of individuals who died of drug overdose, a much greater number of individuals who found their lives ruined by drug addiction to crack cocaine. And add on top of that the swelling of the United States pr prison population to a million strong at any given moment in time over the last number of years um, pulled from the African-American community. And remember that that is a million families. And that these are experiences that have accrued only the last few decades. And on top of that, the fact that 30% of the African-American community survives on less than $25,000 a year at this very moment. How many Americans are we talking about? How many families are we talking about? Now, it is one thing to have a conversation about the New York Times. It is one thing to have a conversation about your most extreme Black Lives Matter activists. And these are conversations to be had. But when we are talking about the elemental reality of resistance in the African-American community and among others to the idea that which we should be embracing of an idealistic patriotism, we need to make the case as Glenn has done. But we need to make the case while reckoning, forgive the term, with the lived experience 
of people whose context for looking at America is born largely or maybe even wholly from this history of deprivation that goes from slavery all the way to the present moment for far too many. At what point in the story that I just told of the Black experience in America does the American dream ever show up for many of these African Americans? Now, I am African American. You know, my wife is Black. And as a way of illustrating the point, I will make the point that I am a person who grew up in Martin Luther King Jr.'s promised land. I grew up in Dr. King's beloved community, as did many Black people. The cultural shifts that were accomplished in the nonviolent movement, the civil rights movement, changed American culture for the better. It made my life possible. My father is white from the South, happens to be a Republican and conservative. My mother is black, liberal Democrat from inner city Los Angeles. My Southern grandparents were not immediately embracing of the idea of an interracial marriage, but by the time I came along, they couldn't have loved me or my brother more. All right. There's change that takes place in the Wood family. There's change that takes place in America. The American people and the American project can and has grown closer to what it was always meant to be. But my wife's experience in American life is far different. She has a very different attitude with respect to the, the easy sort of glorification of patriotism that I have. And it's crystallized in our experience with the Los Angeles riots. The LA riots are a faint memory in my mind. I remember at the age of five years old, 1992, my father being worried about my mother who had gone to work uh, during the midst of the violence, worried she would never come home. But ultimately she came home and life went on as normal, coming close to some violence and middle-class Culver City, California, but never being too deep into it. My wife at the age of four lived 15 minutes and 15 miles away from me in Watts, California, and laid on the floor to avoid gunfire as sirens blared, as sirens blared and as fires burned for days, looking at the coverage on the news as her, as her community went up um, in fire and death, and living a life in the projects, living a life in inner city Los Angeles, uh, over the course of the late 80s, early to mid 90s, my wife has seen more death and murder than some people have seen serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. That is her American experience. That is where it began. And so in making the case for black patriotism, we must stress the overcoming that is exemplified in the black American experience. And we must also do so while earnestly recognizing and acknowledging the pain of that experience, so that in making the case to Black Americans that we need to embrace this country's legacy and founding ideals as our own inheritance, we can make this case also demonstrating the fact that we are not unmindful, and Glenn Lowry is not unmindful, but to do so in a way that makes the case that we are firmly and deeply aware, not as an abstract mat matter, but as a real felt matter, of the experience that many people are trailing behind them as they express their skepticism or even cynicism with respect to the American project, and still point to the fact that progress is real, that the American journey towards the beloved community, towards a more perfect union, is a provably successful one over the long arc of history, and yet that we not, cannot remain, that we cannot be complacent, we cannot be satisfied with how far we have come. Because if we we're to truly do honor to this inheritance, we must recognize that there's much further to go. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm sure both of you are aware of recent polls taken of in the black community, the white community, about how many unarmed black kids have been gunned down by uh, the police. And the the average answer, I, I'm just 
pulling these numbers uh, out of thin air, but I think it's it, among blacks, they say thousands. Among whites, it's also a very, very high a number. But the question is, do you think that some of the anger that the black community is feeling comes from the misinformation being fed to them by mass media and in the academic community about things like uh, uh, black deaths and the fact that black youth can't walk out of their house without being in mortal terror? Yes. <clears throat> I don't think there's any question about that. And I uh, hold the press, uh, speaking broadly, uh, responsible for um, not uh, disabusing people of the uh, false perception that, as uh, Attorney Benjamin Crump put it in the title of his book, there's open season on Black people, or that, as uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton put it at George Floyd's funeral, America needs to take its knee off the neck of Black people. These are hyperbolic, false statements about the conditions of Black people. And as quickly as the press would point out uh, fact-checking the lies, quote unquote, told by Republican politicians, they should be willing to point out the lies being told to the American people and to Black American people about the conditions of Black people. And let me take this opportunity to say something else. The future of the country depends on disabusing people with these false claims about the reality of the Black condition. Did you see what happened in the summer of 2020? Do you think that there's not going to be another Black kid somewhere killed by a white cop somewhere in this country? It's going to happen. I'm sorry to have to report. Do you think we can take it, this democracy, if every other year and every third year people run around burning this bitch down because a Black kid got killed by a white cop? The stakes are enormously high here. So when I, like I say, getting the narrative right, getting the story straight, telling the truth about the conditions of our country and our people is paramount. And as for um, sensitivity to the feelings of people, demagogues, who fuel this kind of false outrage, I don't have time for it, and neither do you. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to to weigh in on that point as well. First of all, let me say that I um, I agree with Glenn deeply, sympathize on the point that as a sheer empirical matter, uh, it does not it does not appear to me that you can easily make the case that given the rate of police interactions between you know the African American community and and law enforcement that the rate of police homicides um, or police killings I should say I should not say homicides necessarily but that the rate of police killings of black people is wildly out of proportion to what you might expect given the frequency of interactions and in any event, as an absolute number, I believe that more white people are killed by police in a given year than African Americans. Um, where I take a somewhat different angle from Glenn, I guess, is on the sensitivity question here, although I would distinguish somewhat between the gatekeepers and the opinion makers who have perhaps an institutionally vested interest in perpetuating certain interpretations of current events and ordinary Americans and ordinary Black Americans at their kitchen tables and in schools who are, who are reacting to both what is coming across the airwaves, but also things that they are experiencing in their own communities. Part of what people experience in their communities, and Glenn is probably more familiar than I am with the work of Roland Fryer, um, but is, is a circumstance in which Surrounding factors make it inevitable that Black Americans will have more encounters with law enforcement. These encounters will be and are, are predominantly negative in which the use of physical force, not lethal violence, but physical force becomes much more a part of the ordinary culture of many Black American communities day by day 
because of surrounding factors, set this against the backdrop of a history in which violence between law enforcement and members of the black community in the 1970s and the 1980s, you think of a movie like Gangs of New York, for instance, uh, about the, you know, essentially the, the drug dealer Frank Lucas, in which you have the, uh, you have conflicts of a corrupt nature between cops and members of the community that that turn violent. These stories and cultural narratives born from real experiences join stream with the fact that even while there's been major progress in, in America today in terms of the relationships between the African American community and law enforcement, perhaps until the the um, portrayal of events that that Glenn has has described here, in spite of all that, you still have a real context in which relationships could stand to be a whole lot better between the Black community and the community of law enforcement. But I think that if we don't see that as operating in the background of the larger conversation over police violence, even notwithstanding this manipulation of statistics that we're referring to here, I think that we don't do ourselves any favors in empowering ourselves to be able to communicate with people who are in part reacting to these historic and day-to-day -day circumstances of Black experience. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, uh, the comments were really electrifying and provocative uh, for me, and I'm sure for everyone here. Could you each give an example of a policy change that might happen that would really benefit the material situation of Blacks in America and is also embraced by Black America as a, as a kind of starting point of where we might go in a way that is less divisive and culture war based? Well, how about if we open up educational service delivery in this country to the supply of all different parties who can bring something to the table and let the parents vote with their feet about where they take their kids to be educated. Frankly, I think that's popular among black people. It's very unpopular among black Democrats. The, the reason is called the National Education Association. Not any different than any other labor union in advocating the interest of its employees. But as a matter of fact, they work for us. We don't work for them. Let my people go. I mean, I would, I would second that. Um, polls have shown, I think, pretty regularly that, that uh, school choice is something that a majority of Black parents uh, in many American cities are actually supportive of. It's, it's not until you get to the sort of institutional level and perhaps the education establishment, if you will, that there's, that there's not more pronounced resistance to that idea. Um, I am uh, interested um, also in exploring certain approaches to restorative justice. Um, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on this subject, but we are having this conversation, you know, again, against the sort of historical and recent sort of historical reality of the fact that you had many, many African Americans who were sentenced to lengthy prison terms for drug consumption, right? Uh, or for violence that took place in neighborhood and communal circumstances, wherein, yes, accountability is something that needs to be levied. But if there is a possibility for social repair to take place within communities where the circumstances in which an offender are taken into account in a mediated interaction with the victim of a particular crime, that there might not be more constructive outcomes uh, yielded as a result of a restorative uh, justice sort of you know framework for for delivering uh, accountability. But you know we, we don't make any progress towards any of this if we can't actually have the conversations about the reality of of life on the ground, of race in America, and of the circumstances in which black Americans find themselves on the lower end of the of the um, opportunity ladder in American life. So I'm hoping we can advance the conversation to a place to where we can have those conversations in earnest. Well, uh, unfortunately, we are, we are out of time. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. We're gonna have to 
cut it off there, but um, I, I do want to thank uh, all of you for being here today and, and, and thank both uh, Glenn Lowry and John Wood for uh, two deeply informed perspectives. And I do hope, as John was just saying, we can continue to have conversations like this and, and sort of bring more, more light than heat to these discussions as, as both of these gentlemen have done here this afternoon. So thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.